a sense of loss that resides within all of us now will partially heal in time, I trust. The memories of the loving families and friends and acquaintances that were caught up in the tragedy of December 13th, 1977 will never be forgotten. I feel certain. The chill of another southern Indiana winter fell over the city of Evansville, Indiana in November of 1977. But the excitement of a new college basketball season breathed life into this Midwestern town that had its hopes set on a new era of NCAA promise. The University of Evansville Purple Aces, a school of national basketball prominence in Division II, had just made the leap into the Division I ranks. A fresh, young, charismatic coach by the name of Bobby Watson brought fire and energy to an Aces team that would be comprised of eight new freshman players who were recruited to form the nucleus of a championship program. This dream would never come. On a foggy night in the middle of December, all the hopes of the players and the entire community would come crashing down with the remains of a promising young program scattered along a muddy hillside on the north side of town. And it was a night, uh, it was rainy, it was kind of cold, it wasn't sleeting, but it was just a, it wasn't a good night weather-wise. I come back from covering a game at the stadium and as soon as I come in the back door where we had parked the news car, I had shot film of that game. Uh, I, I come into the newsroom and my boss, uh, the boss who ran the station, a man named Conrad Kegel, looks at me and he says, it's the aces. And when those words were said, everything changed. Thousands of fans poured into Robert Stadium on the night of November 30th to welcome in a new era of Evansville Aces basketball. The team ran out wearing new white and purple jerseys, replacing the old orange jerseys of the Arad McCutcheon era. This was Bobby Watson's team, and he had his players ready to take on some of the best college athletes in the country. However, Western Kentucky reminded Evansville that this season would be tougher than it seemed, handing the Aces an 82-72 season opening loss. The next game would not be any easier, as the team flew to Chicago only to come home with another humbling loss, this time to the DePaul Blue Demons. The magic moment finally came when the Pittsburgh Panthers arrived in Evansville. That night, the Aces secured their first Division I victory, a 90-83 to decision that once again renewed the excitement for U of E basketball. A loss to Larry Bird and an Indiana State team that was nationally ranked in the top ten did not keep the Aces from looking optimistically toward an upcoming schedule, which included a very winnable game against Middle Tennessee State on December 14th. The Aces gathered at Dress Regional Airport on the north side of town on December 13th, 1977. And that Tuesday morning, Brian and I had uh, ridden out to Highland Elementary School to observe some elementary school classes. He had a car and I didn't, so we rode out there in his yellow Jeep. And uh, I remember vividly, he, he, you know, I was very interested in the basketball team and, and asking him how the game was going to go that night at Middle Tennessee State, I believe it was. And he said, well, I think we got a few seats on the plane. Um, I obviously couldn't leave with no notice. I had some uh, performance expectations that evening, so I didn't take him up on it. But... Uh, uh, that's the last time I saw Brian or any of the guys, of course. In previous years, the team would have taken a bus to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, but this year they traveled on a charter DC-3 airplane, another perk of Division I athletes. In addition to the 14 members of the Aces, 15 other persons would be boarding the plane that night. Among them were Marv Bates, the team's broadcaster and a well-respected man in the community, and Mark Canisi a student trainer who aspired to become a professional in his trade. A slight rain fell through the foggy night as the pilots prepared the craft for takeoff. The following sequence of events would lead to one of the worst disasters in NCAA sports history. The plane pitched up at a high angle immediately after takeoff and banked sharply to the left. It clipped tree branches as it tried to gain power while losing altitude. Witnesses to the crash say that the plane began rocking from side to side as it nosedived toward the nearby hillside. Seconds later, the engines revved one last time before the plane smashed into the hill, bursting into pieces as a huge ball of fire exploded at the point of impact. Residents from nearby subdivisions raced toward the crash site minutes after the explosion. The scene that awaited them was grave. 
Flames spewed from piles of twisted metal. The bodies of the plane's passengers had been launched from the aircraft and were scattered along a muddy embankment that led to a set of railroad tracks. The patrons trudged through knee-deep mud to reach the crash victims. Upon seeing the carrying bags that were strewn amongst the wreckage, they made a grim realization. This plane had been carrying the University of Evansville basketball team. Uh, my wife and I had just gone on to, uh, over to the uh, uh, music hall for a, a music performance uh, that night. Rainy, terrible night weather-wise. And uh, just before the uh, program began, why, uh, Thornton Padberg, who was vice president for student affairs, came up and asked me to come outside and told me that there was a rumor that uh, the uh, t plane carrying our team to Tennessee had crashed. I was sitting right behind Dr. Wallace Graves at the University of Evansville's uh, Wheeler Concert Hall. I think, if I remember correctly, it was a Philharmonic String Quartet concert. And in the middle of the first half, one of the U of E vice presidents came in and asked Dr. or whispered something in Dr. Graves' ear, and he turned white and got up immediately and left. And uh, then, of course, at, at intermission in the concert, uh, we heard the news, and a friend and I rushed over to my parents' house about four blocks away uh, to watch the TV coverage that was already beginning. Tragically. Only a handful of players were still alive by the time the residents arrived. Of these, only freshman player Greg Smith lived long enough to make it to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead five hours later. The bodies of the rest of the team and crew were removed from the wreckage and placed on a train, where they were transported downtown to the community center. A solemn procession of rescue workers and volunteers continued to sift through the wreckage long into the night, with expressions of utter shock and amazement etched onto their faces. The next morning, the first stories of the crash hit the press. People woke up to read about the tragedy that had happened the night before. When something like that happens, you, there's a terrible sickness in your stomach, and uh, even though you may not have lost a loved one, you were just, it, uh, and I, I, I don't want to, say that the same magnitude it was like for Evansville it was like a 9-11 uh, granted not as many people were killed but it just tears at the at your inner fiber and you you go oh my gosh you just feel dear God how did this happen why did it happen and you couldn't and it was it was unfathomable you know you couldn't believe that all 29 the news sent shockwaves through a city that was learning of the deaths of their beloved team. At the community center, the scene was solemn. Students and friends gathered in silence to console each other and to share their grief. Assistant coaches Ernie Simpson and Mark Sandy, who were scouting games when the plane crashed, came to help identify the bodies and comfort the families. After the bodies were cleaned and tentatively identified, the families of the victims came in to see their sons and brothers, husbands, and uncles. Clergymen from local churches were on hand to pray for the families and offer any support that was needed. The realization of this tragedy had begun to sink in. Evansville was frozen in time that morning, paralyzed by the loss of 29 great people who had died so suddenly the night before. On December 17th, the city of Evansville gathered in silent sorrow at Robert Stadium, where just weeks before the Aces had taken to the court in youthful exuberance. Now the floor was filled with the family members and close friends of the players who had perished only five days prior. The rest of the stadium was crowded with nearly 5,000 people who came to pay their respects to their lost companions. Only a short time ago the stadium was filled with raucous fans and students, but now these same individuals sat in awesome silence as the president of the university spoke about the tragedy. His message promised the onlookers that Evansville would rise up from this unspeakable event and that they would be stronger than ever as they carried on the spirit of the University of Evansville Aces 1977 basketball team. After words of condolences from a host of speakers, a misty-eyed crowd joined the Aces symphonic band and concert choir in singing the hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. As the city of Evansville mourned, Investigators began pouring into Evansville to decide why and how such a reliable airplane 
such as a DC-3 crash just minutes after takeoff. Crews were brought in to remove the wreckage and document precisely where each piece had lain. Most of the parts were then moved to a nearby airport hangar, while the engines were set off to the manufacturer in North Carolina to undergo a thorough investigation. Detectives began asking for witnesses who either saw or heard the plane while it was in flight over Melody Hills subdivision. The first clue that the detectives received from the witnesses indicated that the plane clipped a few tree branches on Twickingham Drive, one block away from the University of Evansville's athletic director, Jim Byers. About the plane was supposed to have departed around 4 o'clock, I think 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. And so I just assumed that, that the plane had already uh, departed from Evansville. And um, so I, after got through in the office, I went home for dinner and I came back to the office and I uh, got back in about 7 o'clock. And then uh, it wasn't too much later, I guess, I can't remember exactly, it was 8 or um, uh, sometime in, in uh, between 7.30 and 8.30, I got the call. And I didn't believe it. One witness said she saw the plane rocking from side to side before it disappeared behind a hill. Seconds later, she heard the engines rev and then a muffled explosion. Other witnesses came forward to give their accounts of the crash, but none of their testimonies led to any definite conclusions. No one was able to identify the plane's flight path from the time it passed over the subdivision until just moments before it crashed. Control tower employees were able to offer their insight on the crash as well. One said that the plane had taken off at an extremely sharp angle and banked left into the fog too quickly. Perhaps the best witness to the crash was Robert D. Wood, who was working as a supervisor for Allegheny Airlines that night when the plane passed over his office. He testified that the plane took off at an unusually steep angle with the left wing banked about 45 degrees. The plane moved to the left toward the nearby Sunset Cemetery, which was located on a hill. In an attempt to avoid the hill, Wood said the plane pitched upward and disappeared into a cloud. Seconds later, the plane reappeared through the clouds in a nosedive before leveling off and turning left, disappearing from Wood's sight. Wood began to go back into his office but stopped when he saw the plane's landing lights and the craft moving toward the east-west runway in an apparent attempt to land the craft. Seconds later, the engine noise increased and the plane struck the hill, bursting into flames. Wood's testimony, given at the executive end during a three-day conference to determine why the plane crashed, provided the most detailed account of the plane during its fatal flight. The conference, while providing multiple theories that could have led to the crash, was not able to give the public a conclusive and certain explanation. This didn't come until August 17, 1978, when the National Transportation Safety Board finally made its long-awaited report to the public. The report cited two reasons for the plane's demise. The first was the crew's failure to remove external control locks from the rudder and right aileron of the plane. The locks, which were put on to prevent wind gusts from damaging the plane on the ground, were not removed by the co-pilot prior to takeoff, as evidenced by the presence of the two locks at the crash site. Failure to remove them most likely made it difficult for the pilot to control the plane once it took off. The report cited the failure to properly load the passenger's luggage as a second reason the plane crashed. Witnesses who saw the luggage being loaded said that aside from a few small clothing bags, the rest of the items were stored in the rear compartment of the plane. This uneven distribution of weight in the plane was the cause of its unusual upward pitch at the onset of the flight, officials concluded. The combination of this steep climb and the pilot's inability to regain complete control of the plane were officially named the cause of the crash nearly nine months after the tragedy occurred. Gradually, Evansville was able to pick up the pieces and move forward after the crash. But uh, in January, uh, suddenly uh, the mayor of Pittsburgh got in touch with us and said he was sending the, uh, the professional football team uh, in to play a basketball game against our alumni. Uh, and also he was sending a ping pong champion that uh, lived there, and uh, quite a show actually. And so we did that, and it, uh, uh, it was such fun that it uh, sort of dispelled the pall that had been hanging over Robert Stadium. 
As the sting of such a terrible loss began to fade, the university started to think of ways to honor their fallen companions. The agreement was to fund a memorial that would be erected in Evansville to honor the victims of the crash. Money began to pour in from around the country to support the school as it endured a painful rebuilding process. The memorial that now stands on the University of Evansville campus continues to celebrate the lives of those young teammates, coaches, and avid supporters. And yet today, 30 years after that fateful night, the university continues to thrive in this Midwestern town, and its basketball program is once again on the rise. But for the people who were in Evansville on December 13, 1977, the memories of that night will live on forever in their hearts. In closing, Dr. Graves, let us pick up the ashes of the broken dreams, hopes, and the goals of the basketball program. Let us dedicate our future success to Bobby, the team, and the others who believe so strongly in those dreams and gave their lives.